featuring a panel discussion on advanced materials. Gain exciting insights into future trends. With panelists, Lutz Walter, Jerome Bill, Thomas Schmidt. Moderated by Adrian Wilson. Hello and welcome to the 8 Mile Live panel discussion on advanced materials. My name is Adrian Wilson of AWOL Media. We're going to talk today about the advanced materials that will be produced on the new technologies that will be displayed at Idmar in 2023. Together, I hope we can provide a brief overview of where the industry is at right now and a little of what we can expect at the exhibition. I'm very pleased to have on the panel with me uh, Lutz Walter, who has over 20 years of experience um, as Director of Innovation and Skills at Yordatex and is currently Secretary General of the European Technology Platform, the ETP. He has a broad knowledge of the textile industry and technology trends. Uh, we also have Jerome Beale, who has worked with Fibreline in various roles over the past 18 years, and that is now CEO of the company. He's joined by Dr. Thomas Schmidt, a chemical expert with extensive experience in the textile and coating industry. Dr. Schmidt started his career in Europe, but is now currently an interdisciplinary innovation team leader at Huafeng, a large textile supplier in Puchan, China. So, um, Lutz, can you tell us in a nutshell what the role of the European Textile Platform is, how it assists textile manufacturers and some of the advanced materials that are arising now from ETP projects? Yes, Adrian. So the European Textile Technology Platform, ETP in short, is the largest European community of professionals involved in textile research and innovation. So that is companies, that is research centers, that is universities, uh, technology developers, um, suppliers to the textile and clothing industry, obviously all focused based in Europe. And what we essentially do is three things. We support networking. So we bring people together from across Europe and from across these different domains, industry to research and higher education. We, we enable joint learning and um, also development of strategies, of roadmaps, of visions for the future. And, and thirdly, we facilitate access to EU funding uh, because the European Union has a large program um, supporting research and innovation in, in all sectors of the economy, including textiles. And that's what we try to do. We've been doing that for more than 15 years now. And uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent community. And we, we really, we work in the pre-competitive domain of research and innovation. So that's, that's essentially what we do. And, uh, and that is something that is, uh, that is developing extremely well. There's more and more need for uh, textile research and innovation. And that's what we're trying to support every day. Okay. The, the, uh, the ETP SmartX pro program, uh, that's creating some, some exciting uh, new concepts based around the integration of textiles uh, with electronics. Um, how are things progressing with that project? Yes, yeah, SmartX is a, is a wonderful program. And uh, I'm not saying that lightly because uh, not all programs that are publicly funded lead to immediate impact and, and real sort of hands-on innovation work, but that's what SmartX does. So what we do essentially is we are supporting uh, small scale uh, startups or small companies active in smart textiles or e-textiles, which is basically combining textile materials with microelectronic components, with uh, integrated systems, with Internet of Things, IoT, as it's called these days, in order to realize smart functions for many different end markets, most of them variable, whether it's in medical and sports and uh, personal protection and so on, but also non-variable stuff that goes into automotive, into smart homes and, 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 and things like that. And, um, and we can see that after, well, what we call probably 20 years of research and development in that domain, we finally see things coming to the market. So we have now a portfolio of 25 projects involving 50 small companies from all over Europe, working on really wonderful 
really close to market uh, innovations in that domain of smart textiles, uh, spanning the whole field of application that I mentioned. So from sports, from from uh, medical, um, elderly care, um, gaming, um, personal protection, automotive, and so on. So, and it's it's a program that's been running since mid 2019. We're still running it until uh, mid of next year, and uh, final results will be out. The first projects are coming to an end right now, and uh, the whole portfolio will then come to an end uh, by by mid next year. And uh, and we'll show the the results, and it's really it's a wonderful program. Excellent, yeah. Look forward to seeing the results of some of these projects. Jerome, Fibreline um, has been a long-standing exhibitor at ITMA. You have a portfolio of technologies with which new functionality uh, can be added into textile webs. Can you explain how these work? Yes, thank you, thank you, Adrian. Yes, we, we indeed have um, in Fibreline developed a, a portfolio of technologies to, to dry impregnate powder into porous structures. And this is the result of an important uh, R&D effort over the last years. And um, the, the principle of those technologies is to, um, let's say, after having distributed the powder on the top of the structure to apply an alternating electric field to charge those particles of powder and accelerate them through the porosities of a, of a structure. So in the end, when we apply this alternating electric field, we create um, a plasma ionization of the air. And this ionization is charging the particles of powder, explaining that they try to move, they try to occupy all the space and penetrate into the, the porosities of the structures. And um, this is a technology that, uh, that can use any type of powder. So that can, uh, let's say, create a lot of new products. A lot of uh, our projects are, uh, of course, in the innovation uh, because it's a new tool, it's a new technology. So we are creating new things for various uh, various sectors. And um, this is also true that this technology can replace existing solutions like the liquid or solvent-based impregnation uh, to improve and to, to reach a greener or more sustainable solutions to eliminate the solvent or, of those solutions. And uh, this is leading to relatively ecological and uh, energy efficient solutions. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so basically everything that you're achieving is possible really because textiles and non-wovens um, in particular are basically just, just full of holes. Yes, indeed. Uh, the um, textiles uh, or non-wovens are, are porous materials, so they have different porosities and it's true that we work from uh, relatively thin materials like papers or uh, non-thin non non-wovens up to relatively thick products like the foams or, or, or thick, thick structures uh, in the non-moving business, in the insulating business. So we have really a wide range of applications and we, we have the teams to, to work with our partners to, to really uh, optimize their, uh, their product and adapt the powder to, 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 their, uh, to their structures. And we were talking about the portfolio of technologies that we, we have developed. We have no four uh, pro proprietary technologies one is dedicated to relatively large weight uh, in the technical textile business. And that was the first that we have developed. And then we have adapted our technologies to high speed solutions, especially for the uh, hygiene business. So we, we have installed line running up to 500 meters per minute, which is what was a challenge for us to, to adapt our solutions like this. And then we also uh, adapted our uh, solutions to the medical business, to the biomedical business, uh, needed really very, very clean solutions, able to be implemented into clean rooms. And this is what we have done with the creation of the Espreg technology, and that is now uh, on the market for a few years. And the last one, we took the opportunity of the COVID situation uh, and the fact that we had a bit more internal resources to develop a solution for yarns and tapes. So uh, it is again extending the, the possible use of our technologies to, uh, to, to yarns, to technical yarns and to composite tapes. So we have a wide range of solutions and all our day-to-day -day business is really to work with our partners to adapt our solutions to their needs. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and Thomas, Thomas Wafang is, is doing some rather wonderful things uh, in textile coatings, uh, specifically for improving the aesthetic appeal of clothing and footwear. Uh, can you give us a quick snapshot of the company's progress uh, to date? Yes, I, I would like uh, to introduce our haptic uh, coating technology to you. Uh, 
or haptic uh, is a is a coating technology but when people think about coatings usually they think about a very thin maybe colorful film but what we did we added a third dimension to our coating so now we can apply 3d coatings with very high thickness in an extreme case we go up to four millimeter thickness and these coatings look nice they have a, a visual uh, nice appearance but they also have a lot of function they can be a soft touch or a hard and a rough touch. Uh, they have touch uh, uh, surfaces. Um, we have um, also anti-stretch uh, control uh, coatings and we also have a very high abrasion resistance. Uh, so sensitive textiles can be very well protected. Okay. Sustainability is also a, a major um, goal for our, all our developments we do in the coatings and uh, we focus totally on waterborne uh, coating systems, so no solvent. Uh, we also developed uh, additive um, coating uh, technologies where we can step by step build up the coating thickness and we add the material where we need it and no material is wasted uh, through cutting waste, for example. Our coatings can be nicely combined with our textile. Textiles is anyway our core business in, in Huafang. Uh, and we have uh, many different types of knitting and uh, weaving technologies. And uh, by um, selecting the right type of uh, fabric and combining it with an interesting design of the selective uh, additive haptic coating, uh, you can create some very unique uh, uh, designs and, and features uh, mainly used on footwear today. Uh, but in some cases, it can also be uh, used on apparel. So how do we think um, textile manufacturing will change within the next five years? Any thoughts, Lutz? Well, five years is probably a short, a too short time frame for dramatic changes. Um, but I believe there's some long term trends um, on the way that will lead to fairly significant changes over the next uh, maybe 10 years. Uh, or more. And, and I would like to give four examples. The first one is that if you look at the current material supply uh, or the sources of materials uh, in the industry, we're approximately 70% synthetic, mostly polyester, of course, and 30% natural or bio-based. And I believe that these percentages will shift uh, fairly dramatically over maybe the next 10, 15 years in favor of bio-based renewable and recycled, I would include in that as well. And that will have a profound impact. Uh, that will be a transition that is not easy to accomplish. Um, it will, uh, both from the economic point of view, uh, reaching price points also in bio-based and, and, and renewable materials that are comparable to, to synthetics, but especially in the performance, on the performance side. So having bio-based uh, fibers that meet the same performance uh, characteristics as the synthetics today will not be easy, but I believe there will be pressures, and I think we all know uh, these pressures, political, societal, and so on, to go away from fossil base towards renewable uh, materials, uh, and recycling obviously is also an, a significant element in there. So that will be a, a big transition. Um, the same, in a way, also affects uh, textile chemistry. So where we, we have a lot of pressure, uh, especially here in Europe, but I think around the world on um, phase out of what are considered hazardous or, or, or chemicals of concern um, for human health or the environment. So they will be, and, and we have seen that over the years, there are options uh, for textile uh, treatment that are being taken away from the market by regulators. And that will continue, that will even accelerate. So we have to replace um, today's textile chemistry in a in a fairly significant way, and that again is a long it's a long process, but there will be no choice. So that I think is is a very significant element. The third one is I believe over time manufacturing will move closer to the point of consumption, and I mean that not just geographically but also in time. I will I believe we will see more flexible, uh, smaller scale. Um, but still as efficient uh, production technologies, production locations that can produce kind of made to order on demand, very close to where the customer is. And uh, both, I believe, in the consumer, but also in the, in the business to business, in the technical textile market. And that will favor certain technologies over others. I think all technologies that are 
more flexible where you can produce smaller lots, uh, smaller runs. We've seen it with digital printing. I think also um, knitting technologies have certain advantages these days because they are more flexible. Um, everything that reduces assembly processes, which are often a bottleneck in textiles and especially in apparel, we know that. So, so, so these are, I think, also big trends. Also now with all the discussion about global supply chains, how stable are they? How cost effective are they? How easy they are to manage? Um, including legal pressure on uh, on those uh, where you say you have as a as a as a company that puts product on the market, you have to be able to trace your entire supply chain wherever they are and make sure that uh, whatever goes on there is is in compliance with all the environmental, social, and other legislation. So that's that's difficult too. And the last one I I, I would mention, I come back to the the smart X, the smart textiles element. Is I believe we will see. A major breakthrough in these e-textiles or smart textiles and that will also they have to be manufactured and that will not be easy so we will have to see a certain convergence between the textile and the microelectronics industry and that will be also a very interesting shift mm -hmm. yeah very much so very much anything uh, anything you'd like to uh, add to this Shiro? Uh, yeah, yes, we, we also have, um, you know, due to the fact that our technology is a, is a new tool, a new process, um, all of our projects are in the end innovative products because people are, are uh, in, inventing new things with, with, our, with our technologies. And it's true that we can see that there is maybe two main directions um, if we want to find the, the, main, uh, the main direction of the project are greener product, more ecological product, and I can give you some examples. And the second one may be uh, more technical products, more performances uh, in the direction of smart textiles, as it was mentioned. Um, I can uh, give an example. For example, if we talk about greener product, we have a, a project um, with uh, Owa Tramico uh, to, to develop an, a new headliner. Uh, so today they have a process uh, with uh, using solvent-based impregnation and all solution enable us to um, do the similar type of product, but in a dry way without any solvent. So they can really get rid of uh, the use of the solvent with uh, two main consequences. For the workers, no VOCs during the, the let's say the, the molding of the parts, and also no VOCs at the end during the use of the product in the car, which is something that is more and more uh, demanded by the car makers. So um, this is a typical example where our technology is not bringing a new product, but is replacing uh, an existing solution and uh, going to a greener concept. So this is clearly, we have also other projects in that direction in the composite business, where uh, as mentioned by Lutz, people are more and more using bio-based material. So typically part of form uh, polymers are also uh, potentially bio-based polymer, and we can see more and more demand in that direction to have combinations between bio-based polymer plus natural fiber or biodegrad biodegradable mat materials. So that's clearly a, an important direction. And the second one with the new technology is clearly to go to more technical and more performing products. And um, we also have a couple of examples in that, in that direction uh, with um, a lot of products in the med tech industry that we have developed. Uh, we have, for example, developed with GATT uh, a patch um, to, to impregnate an hemostatic powder into a non-woven so that uh, this product can significantly improve the, uh, the, the efficiency and the fastness of the uh, hemostatic effect during a surgery. So it stops bleeding, I think, closer than 10 times faster than the ex existing products. And this is really a combination between our technology and their special chemistry. So this is, again, a, a more in the direction of a more performing product. And uh, maybe a, a last example, uh, combining finally those two, uh, those two aspects, we, we have uh, established a collaboration uh, and an exclusive collaboration for the cosmetic business uh, with uh, a company called Eurowipes. Um, it's a company that really wants strategically uh, to go to greener and more natural product. This is the, the direction they want to go with their uh, wipes and masks uh, product for cosmetic business. And our technology is really uh, fits really well with this objective because they can, uh, of course, eliminate all the liquids and all the, the solvents and water used uh, today in the, in, the, in the wipes. And they can uh, go to a more natural product without any preservatives needed due to the fact that it is a dry uh, solution. 
So that is, again, uh, going in this direction of a more ecological concept, but it is also combining more technical product because with this partner, we also have developed um, product, uh, for example, um, masks with several functions in the same mask, which is something that is not easy or not potentially uh, obtainable with the conventional technologies. And our technologies are able to place a specific powder in a specific area of the mask and another one in another area. So we can really uh, develop totally new concept, uh, innovative concept with multifunctional masks. And these are things that will uh, start on the market um, in the coming years. So uh, the idea would, find the idea at the moment is to have this introduced uh, next year, depending of course on the on the on the market um, uh, acceptance. But uh, I think these are the two two main directions of our projects. And um, for us, the other um, very important uh, market in the coming years will be uh, the filtration sector and. Uh, the, the military sector. These are also two, two sectors where we see a lot of innovations coming and a lot of projects uh, on the go. Okay. okay. Hey, Thomas, um, while Feng is doing some rather wonderful uh, new things in textile coating, um, as I mentioned specifically um, for, 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 for improving the aesthetic qualities, your, your customers include many of the leading performance apparel and footwear brands. Do you find they are taking much more of an interest in how their materials are made these days, um, specifically as a result of their commitments to sustainability, which seems to be an emerging theme here in influencing advanced materials? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, and the, the whole market and our customers are all asking for more sustainability in, in their products. And not only the customer, also the final consumer uh, today is asking for uh, sustainability, uh, recycling, um, natural biomaterials. So we, as well, Fung, we also pick up these uh, big trends. And uh, I want to introduce our new recycling uh, coating uh, to you today. Uh, we call it Haptic Reborn because we give a new life uh, to the material. And basically, we, what we do is we, we develop special uh, I don't know if you can clearly see it on the camera. We developed uh, special um, grinding and cutting technologies for waste uh, textiles. And we cut them into very fine fiber material and formulate them into our coating. Uh, today in the lab scale, we can already go up to 50% of recycling material in, inside our, our coating formulation. So recycling technology and developing recycling processes is a, a very big uh, topic here in Wolfgang. And another topic I would like to introduce is our haptic bio, uh, where we use um, new bio resins uh, to formulate the coatings. And we have a, a cooperation uh, with a big chemical company, Covestro. And uh, this is the first prototype of shoe, the first time I show it uh, in the camera and to anybody. So you are really the first <laughs> to see. And this, uh, this coating here is all done with a, with a bio resin and we can add up to, to about 25% of, of bio content into the resin right now. In addition, the mesh, the fabric of the shoe is all made out, out of 100% uh, recycled polyester, recycled from uh, PET bottles. So uh, this is a big step uh, for, towards sustainability and, and more greener technologies. And uh, additional to the product itself, we also invest heavily in uh, sustainable energy. So that means we install solar panels on all our roofs on the factory. We have wind power uh, to, to run our factories. We, we uh, invest into sustainable uh, energy for the dying factory. So there's a lot of activity going on, going on uh, uh, to make the overall operation more sustainable. So, so um, how about digitalization? Is this also having an impact uh, on how materials are being made now? Uh, any, any thoughts on that, Lot? Oh, yes, absolutely. So digitalization is obviously one of the mega trends. And it's, uh, we see that it is going sort of beyond hype into real mainstream in, across all industries, including textile. So we will see our industry becoming a lot more data driven in general. So uh, we already generate enormous amount of data in production and in consumption of textiles, but a lot of this data is not used today, or at least not really very efficiently used. 
So we will see a lot more use for that um, or, or of this data uh, for optimization of production, of course, very directly in the factory, uh, but also for uh, optimization of the product itself. So we'll see a lot more uh, digital design, virtual design, um, but also simulation of textile uh, designs or textile products, um, whether fashion or technical. Um, and that that simulation will include not just uh, will include all aspects of textiles, including, for instance, um, uh, things like uh, like touch or movement. And that will be very realistic. And we will see uh, probably, especially in the product development process, a lot less production of physical samples and a lot more of uh, uh, simulation and design in the virtual world, and then you go almost directly into production. So that's uh, that I think is a, is an important trend. Um, there will be obviously big impacts in the digital digitalized factory uh, when you see. Obviously, we see a, we will see a rise in robotics. We will see a rise in the use of machine vision, uh, uh, machine learning. Um, we also will see uh, augmented reality, virtual reality used for, for instance, remote maintenance and these kind of things. So, so and all sorts of human machine interfaces that will that will change over time. Um, but there will there's also a very important aspect of managing the whole supply chain, of course, in a in a much more digital way, using data and exchanging data that today is not uh, is not happening. Uh, for various reasons, some technological, some sort of cultural, in, in a way, and there we all will see. We will see also pressures from 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 regulation, for instance, and from the market to say that every producer has to be able to trace uh, what is going on in their supply chain in terms of production, in terms of materials, in terms of chemicals, in terms of energy, in terms of water, whatever. Um, aspects that then influence in the end uh, what is called a, a product environmental footprint, for instance, is something that you should be able to trace. And you can only do that digitally and you can only do that if you capture the data where the process happens, actually, and then you have ways of communicating that data, storing this data, communicating the data. So, so that is something that um, I think will require enormous investment. Uh, but it's something that will happen. But it will also, again, um, uh, enable new opportunities. So we're talking about digital micro factories these days, and I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that concept. So that we will see manufacturing um, happening at smaller scale, but highly digitized, highly automated, uh, with a lot of input directly from the customer or the end consumer even. So even this kind of the... The, the co-creation process between the consumer or the customer and the producer um, in a in a digital environment that can translate very quickly into manufacturing and into delivery is something that I believe has a lot of potential. So um, so yes, digitalization will be a very important aspect and will will touch manufacturing, supply chain management, and the interaction with the with the end market also. Um, we will see also in the consumer world much more direct to consumer uh, business models where producers directly interact and sell to consumers and and that will change also economics very dramatically in our industry where of course the distribution retail sector played a, a very important role uh, in intermediating for a high cost between the producer and the and the consumer and that is something that uh, digitalization will will question very much so, uh, so e-commerce platforms are a first step, but we're not going to stop there. So, um, so that is something that uh, that will uh, that will change production. I, I, we have seen that in the past that changes in the retail environment, in the distribution environment, have impacts on manufacturing. When we saw the massive shift of productions from the from the West to Asia, for instance, that was not driven by a manufacturing. Uh, innovation. It was driven by changes in the distribution uh, landscape in the US and in Europe. As those larger distribution um, uh, chains emerged, they were able to have very, very complex sourcing operations from around the world. A small retailer could not do that. A single shop could not do that. And that would impact the manufacturing. And we see probably some of that shifting back uh, over, again, also a longer time frame. Right. Right, right. 
Yeah, Jerome, from a machine builder's point of view, um, how how does this digitalization seem to be um, impacting or progressing your your approach? Yeah, so we, indeed we we are not let's say directly uh, involved in this uh, question because we are our, our licensing business model we are transferring our technology to our partners. Uh, mean that we are not uh, ourselves collecting the information uh, during production. We are not producing any product. But it, it is true that uh, we can see that, uh, I think the very complete answer from Lutz uh, is, is clear, but we can see that our partners are more and more collecting information from, uh, let's say, uh, to, to optimize the efficiency and the productivity of their processes and our, our solutions and our machines are totally adapted to, to, to this situation. But not only the productivity, there is also all the question of the um, uh, traceability of the materials and uh, consequently the sustainability of the solutions uh, that are, uh, I think, uh, very much improved by this um, digitalization uh, with a lot of life, life cycle analysis on the product and all the, all the chain, on manufacturing chain of the product. And um, I think also the, the market adaptation uh, in some cases is uh, very much improved with a very high reactivity to, to, the, to the customer's uh, demand uh, nearly immediate. Uh, and I think that's also a big, uh, a big progress of this, um, of this industry. So um, I think that's, on, on, from our side, I think that's more or less what I can add. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Thomas, Thomas, where are you on your digitalization journey? <laughs> Yes, I mean, digitalization happens basically everywhere. And just look at how we communicate today. Uh, digital conferences with customers are an event happening every day. Uh, so uh, the whole way how we communicate and show our products with digital catalogs, with digital communication is already there. Uh, then in addition, we're coming back to our haptic, to our coatings, we, we also develop a, a brand new 3D printing technology, especially made for our haptic coatings. So these haptic coatings can be loaded into that 3D printing machine and then printed directly onto a fabric or on different substrates. We can also print standalone uh, uh, products out of haptic, but uh, usually we use these uh, benefits of good bonding to our textiles and, and then we can apply three-dimensional features on top of a, of a knitted textile. Uh, brand new technology is still in the early stage, uh, it's not on the market yet, but I just give you an outlook what, what's happening. Uh, and uh, another point I would uh, draw your attention is a dyeing house. Our, we have a very modern dyeing factory here. Uh, and uh, this uh, dyeing, the color matching basically happens all automatic and uh, by robots. Uh, so we have a, a color mixing system where picking up the, the dye stuff in, in different uh, volumes and mixing the uh, specific color, which is scanned beforehand and uh, identified, identified in a digital way. Uh, then the, the production uh, a dyeing kitchen in the, the chemical handling is totally automated in our new factory. Uh, so the chemicals will centrally be in a, in a central kitchen will be prepared by robots uh, uh, arranged and then fired through piping systems uh, directly to the dyeing machine. So everything automated, every, everything under software control. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Jerome, Fiberline is not really just, just a machine builder. You, you're very involved in product development with customers. Um, how important is this collaboration with customers to you? Yes, yes, Adrian, it's extremely important. Clearly, um, nobody wants to buy a powder impregnation machine from us. Uh, people are looking for a global solution. So, um, of course, we really have to have a very close relationship with our partners to identify and optimize the powder they need, optimize the structure uh, and um, uh, optimize as well the technology. I already, we already talked about that. We really adapt our solutions to specific cases. So um, this really needs a lot of uh, uh, exchanges with our partners all along the chain of the product development uh, uh, to, together. We, we, for example, uh, work from lab scale together with our partners to, uh, let's say, make a screening of the solution and test different additives, test different content of additive fixation methods. So it's uh, a lot of R&D cooperation. But then when this lab validation has been carried out, 
We have also uh, in our uh, innovation center here in, um, in Lyon, uh, we have all pilot equipments for our technologies and um, the logical next step with our partners is to validate the process in a continuous way. So they bring their teams in our innovation center to, to uh, see the technology running, to um, make some production runs for their customers to, to secure really their projects. So um, this is a lo logical second step. And after that, also when we are talking about the machine integration and the technology transfer, we need to have really also a very close relationship to have an understanding of how to optimize the solution for their specific case, their production speed, their width. So um, all this requires a, a very open exchange with our partners. And um, we are most of the time, not always, but most of the time establishing exclusive agreements for specific fields with our partners. So it's really a win-win situation where uh, we need to have an understanding of the added value our technology will bring to, to, to them. So uh, we have a very open uh, collaboration to, to identify all these because in the end, we will never sell an equipment if our partners hasn't clearly identified all these advantages. They will never invest in a new solution or replace an existing solution with an innovative technology if they have not identified all this. So, it's absolutely essential to have this, uh, this, this very close cooperation with our partners. Yeah, yeah. Good, and looks, I guess the ETP uh, projects are all very much about collaboration anyway, aren't they? Well, uh, for me, without collaboration, there's no innovation. We always have this idea, and I think it's very misguided, that innovations and these breakthroughs happening because some some genius somewhere in a lab or somewhere uh, came up with something incredible. But the reality of innovation is completely different. The reality of innovation is that it's when ideas come together, when people come together, when people who need something come together with people who can possibly provide something, that innovation happens. And I think this is true in all areas of life and it's true in textiles too. And that's what we try to do um, having these collab collaborations, pre-competitive, where people can talk a bit more freely with each other and people can talk across disciplines. People also can talk across the industry and research worlds because we need both. We need people that are kind of unconstrained uh, in their thinking and saying, well, I just try a technology because it seems to work. I have no clue if it makes any economic sense, but I just try it. And then the other, the other side who says, well, we pick up something when it makes sense. And, um, and, uh, and there are things, we've seen it in small textiles, for instance, 20 years ago, we saw the first uh, T-shirts that had LEDs in, included. And people were looking and saying, yes, yeah, a nice gimmick, but well, what's it good for? And nowadays, we have products on the market that, uh, that treat skin cancer with light-emitting textiles. So we've come an enormously long way starting from, if you want, crazy scientists or people who, who thought, well, I have a technology, I can do something, now to uh, some uh, companies that had actually brought something to, uh, to the market. Um, uh, and um, and I, I think that's, that's basically, it's, it's, it's the collaboration that, uh, that makes all of that happen. It's not easy to do that because obviously you are, especially smaller companies are tend to be very, guarded about their uh, their ideas, their developments, their technologies. But in a, in a way, and I think technical textiles is a wonderful example of this. And, and as, as Jerome was mentioning, you talk to your customer all the time and the customer talks to the supplier and the technology developers all the time to exchange on what do you need and what can you do? And then and then something happens. And, and, and that's what we also try to uh, uh, encourage on the on the European level in the ETP. And if we can then use a little bit of, uh, of public funding for the more risky stuff that is a little bit further out, that it has not, no immediate uh, market application, uh, well, then we try to do that. And there's not always a success in this, but, um, but very often we see results coming out that then will be picked up by, um, by companies uh, or, or developers that are closer to market. And maybe five years, maybe 10 years, sometimes 20 years later, we see something in the market that was originally uh, out of some crazy collaboration between a few scientists or some, some enthusiasts from the industry. Okay, and, uh, and Thomas Wafeng uh, also has some interesting ongoing collaborative projects, I believe. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, collaboration is for us also very, very important, especially for the innovation uh, department, because as, as uh, Lutz already said, uh, innovation does not happen at home in the lab. It happens uh, with exchanging ideas with uh, different people, different institutes. We have uh, research cooperation with uh, research centers in, in Europe and in China with universities and scientific centers. Uh, but we also cooperate uh, with uh, industrial partners, with raw materials partners. I have shown this uh, shoe before. There's a coating made out of bioresin. This is a, a cooperation with uh, Covestro, a huge chemical uh, company, and they provide us with the bioresins and we formulate it uh, to become a haptic uh, coating. And the second, uh, second uh, very fruitful cooperation we have with Lycra. Lycra is a company with the elastic materials, with the stretchy polymers, and they have a great knowledge on, on the stretchability. And uh, we have developed a new uh, coating system, a colorful coating system with Lycra. They call it Lycra FitSense. This is a, a new stretch control coating, which can be now very colorful. It can have metallic looks. Uh, it can have uh, all different types of, of uh, special effect colors. Uh, and the coating is stretchy, can control the stretch and stretches uh, still together with the, with the material. So these are kind of um, example projects uh, where we have a, a strong cooperation with raw material suppliers and, and we put our uh, knowledge and our, uh, in, uh, our attention together to create something new. Excellent, excellent. So collaboration is key. And we're seeing uh, many new possibilities as a result of digitalization, including the continued integration of electronics into textiles, the integration of new active particles and enhanced coatings are opening up further uh, avenues for fabrics with function. And then there's the pull uh, from the need for uh, sustainable solutions, driving the development of new fibers, inks, dyes, and processes. That sums it up, I think. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I look forward to meeting you all again at Itmar 2023 in Milan.